Hi folks, Dr. Rob Sivers, and today I'm taking a risk. I'm going to talk about a particular disease entity that I don't have, and I'm saying this right up front, I don't have adequate knowledge about. I have not done a deep dive. I am not deeply knowledgeable about the space. However, so why are you doing the video? This is such a crucially important disease entity that is a metabolic disease entity. And a paper was just recently published about this. So I'm going to give you my off the top of the head factual information. But understand that I'm not an expert in this particular form of metabolic disease. But it is crucial that we understand this. The commonest cause of death in this country is cardiovascular disease and stroke. So intravascular diseases clotting diseases. However, most places in the world, and certainly in this country, trauma, suicide, those things come in, but the second commonest cause of death and the topic of today's discussion is cancer. Cancer. With the cells of your body that should be limited in their division, lose that regulatory, genetic regulatory capacity to divide on demand, but to stop dividing. The stop signal is broken and they continue to divide and they just continue to divide unregulated without any feedback and they can grow locally or they can grow into blood vessels. Parts of them break off because they don't have organ adherence, collagen structure, break off, travel somewhere else in the bloodstream or the lymphatic stream and set up shop somewhere else. Metastatic cancer. That is what cancer is. Cancer is a failure of cell division regulation. And it is primarily a metabolic disorder. There are certain genetic influences that make you more susceptible. And there are certain other substances, what we call teratogenic agents, that we know trigger cells to become cancerous. But today we're going to talk about the overwhelming largest number of those, which is metabolic cancers. And the rates are skyrocketing. When I was in medical school, breast cancer was a rare disorder. Now it is the commonest cancer that kills women. I believe the statistic is one in nine women are going to have and die of breast cancer. And we do mammograms and we do all kinds of screening to evaluate that. And it's occurring younger and younger and younger. Occasionally, I used to see breast cancer in an old, older person when I was in medical school. Now we're getting premenopausal people, younger women, 20s and 30s and 40s, having cancer and dying of cancer. And I want to do a bit of a deep dive into three aspects of this. The first aspect is what causes the increase in cancer. And we're going to look at a particular one. Obviously, there's a myriad of these. I'm going to focus on the commonest, most aggressive, rapidly growing cause. Then we're going to look at treatment and prevention and how you can augment treatment. And this is based on a paper over here that was published in January of this year, January 2024, and was published in a, a very well-reputed journal called Cancer. Cancer 2024. Look in the show notes. And the article's title is The Association of Metabolic Syndrome Scores, Trajectory Patterns, with risks of all cancer types. So they developed a calculation of metabolic harm, metabolic syndrome, which is caused by carbohydrates and hyperinsulinemia. And they looked at the correlation with cancers. It's an epidemiologic study, which you know I rail about, but the, the, the data is valuable, at least in terms of association. And we know there's a causality. So, let me step back a little bit into my world. When I look at people who eat carbohydrates to excess, genetically, we see two types of people. Obviously, it's a bell curve. We see some folks who have a biology that can very readily clear the sugar and turn it into fat. But in order to do that, they have to produce increasing over time quantities of insulin. And normally in the human body, insulin should go up and down, but not only is there a much, much higher insulin production capacity, 
there is a sustainability of high levels of insulin, so there's no fluctuation. It's a flat line. And those are the hyperinsulinemics with mild hyperglycemia. On the flip side, you have people who are mildly hyperinsulinemic. They can produce a little bit of extra insulin. They, they run at a slightly high level, but not up here, kind of over here. But that amount of insulin is incapable. It's too low to regulate the sugar. So they have massive vascular levels of sugar called hyperglycemia that is measurable with moderate to low elevations of insulin. And the hyperglycemics with the lower levels of insulin have the lowest, in the metabolic disease state, the lowest uh, 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 level of cancer in all of these uh, uh, um, hyper-carbohydrate-eating people. Because, and, and the obesogenic group, have the highest risk for cancer. This group dies of heart attacks and strokes and have neuropathy. This group dies of cancer. And the reason for that is because of perpetually elevated insulin and yet insulin resistance where these high levels of insulin can't work. And insulin is at a nuclear level in the nucleus of the cell, a regulatory hormone. And insulin regulates the genes that control cell division. And when you are insulin resistant, the default of switching off cell division, which is regulated by insulin, is broken, and the cells don't stop dividing. So there's an injury, there's inflammation, the cells need to divide. So the inflammation is the trigger for the healing process to initiate, which is cell division. So the cells divide, and once the healing process is completed, there should be an off switch. But there's no off switch. And there are certain tissues that are highly susceptible, more susceptible than others, to that. Brain cells, and I don't know much about this, but glioblastoma is one of those metabolic brain cancers. And there's groups in the UK, groups at, uh, in Boston, that are studying that. So significant increase in some of the brain tumors. And I'm going to leave it there because I, I, I would be speaking beyond my knowledge. But certainly we see those trends. Prostate cancer in men, massive increase. Breast cancer, the big one. Colon cancer, pancreatic cancer. All of those massively rising. Barrett's esophagitis, so gastroesophageal cancers at the junction of the esophagus and the cancer, stomach cancers. Even though those stomach cancer rates should go way down, now that we know about H. pylori, they're starting to increase again. And those are metabolic cancers. So this paper that was published in um, January of this year says this, metabolic syndrome, which is a measurable of the body's response to hyperinsulinemia and to sugar, metabolic syndrome elevates cancer risk. However, a single metabolic assessment does not fully reveal the long-term association with cancer. That's why we haven't put two and two together. And now here's the big word, the big word, inflammation, inflammation, alongside metabolic syndrome, synergistically expedites both the onset and advancement of cancer. Inflammation. So inflammation causes these cells to have to divide, and then the metabolic syndrome or that high insulin blocks the stopping signal. So you get a, a, an active promotion to divide, and then no stopping. It's like having a car with a gas pedal and no brake. Think about that. This study investigates metabolic syndrome score trajectories and cancer risk in a large prospective cohort study. So they looked at 44,000 participants with new onset cancer, and then they, put, they, they looked at metabolic score. And they identified four metabolic score patterns. The first category was low stable, so low metabolic and stable, not fluctuating. The second one was moderate, so some metabolic, moderate to low. The third category was moderate to high, and the last category was elevated increasing. 
So an ongoing worsening metabolic syndrome. So the one is low-level metabolic syndrome, not going anywhere. Those are, at least projectively, the, the, the hypothesis, those are going to be the healthiest with the lowest risk of cancers. And if they did get cancer, the group most likely to respond well to treatment. So stage for stage, the least worst outcome. That was the hypothesis. And the ones with the elevated increasing metabolic syndrome, so they're getting worse metabolically, that should correlate with the highest level of cancer and the worst outcomes. And the results are that compared to participants with a low stable trajectory pattern, the elevated increasing trajectory pattern was associated with an elevated risk, overall a hazard ratio of 1 to, 2 point, 1 to 27. 1 to 27. Now, 1 to 1 or lower shows no risk. Above about, I think if, if I can remember correctly my statistics, 1 to 3, 1 to 5 shows a true correlation. That's epidemiology. That's why, I don't, but no matter who you are, 1 to 27 is always positive. And it is above a 95% confidence interval. So while it is epidemiology, as a causal relationship, that is massively high. So if you look at 100 people that jump out of an airplane without a parachute, that's going to be 1 to 99. Okay, One may survive, 99% of those people die. That's an obvious thing. When you look at people that jump out of an airplane, it's going to be reverse. It'll be 99% of people or even higher survive with a parachute and less than one dies. Okay, so here we've got 27 to 1. And that is how epidemiology makes strength of association. Okay. Um, compared to participants with a low stable trajectory, the elevated increasing pa associate pattern was 1 to 27. And the cancers that were the most common were breast cancer, endometrial cancer, which is female uterine cancer, kidney, which I didn't know about, colorectal, liver, which I knew about, and those were the cancers. Amongst participants with chronic inflammation, so they then looked at inflammation, which is the trigger for cell division. With chronic inflammation, they used a CRP, which is a measure of, a global measure of inflammation above three. The elevated increasing trajectory pattern was significantly associated with subsequent breast cancer, endometrial cancer, colorectal, and liver cancers. So these folks stratified patients with cancer in terms of cause into four different groups. Basically, if we take the top and the bottom, high metabolic, high, uh, uh, metabolic syndrome, low levels of metabolic syndrome, and a statistically very significant increase in cancer risk when you had high metabolic syndrome for certain metabolically associated cancers that I would agree with the one I didn't know about was kidney. So there's no question to my mind that a high carbohydrate, low fat, low uh, moderate protein diet is the worst diet with a genetically hyperinsulinemic person that causes metabolic syndrome. That group of patients is highly susceptible for cancer. Now, the next thing, and this again is anecdotal observations for me, and my knowledge base is not tremendous, but when you look at cancer cells, cancer cells are bizarre looking cells, and very often those bizarre looking cells have lost the ability to use fat as a primary fuel source, so they're glucose obligates, and the higher your blood sugar is, the more rapidly those cells divide, especially when they cannot be regulated by insulin when you're hyperinsulinemic. So those cancer cells <laughs> sucking up the high sugar and just dividing like crazy, going ballistic, dividing, okay? You fertilize a plant, it grows beautifully, unless you over fertilize it, it dies. And the other cells, your regular cells, that can use ketones and sugar, they're dividing, but they're plodding along, whereas these cells are just going vroom, vroom, vroom. Now, if you deprive them of that high sugar, their metabolic, at least their multiplication rate slows down. And then if you use a chemotherapy agent, a cancer agent, that targets these cells with a little bit of collateral damage, if you are on a low-carbohydrate diet or a ketogenic diet, 
where you're supplying fat and ketones. Remember, it's not just ketones, it's non esterified fatty acids, and your insulin level is low. Because remember, insulin is often required to shove the sugar in these cells. So if your insulin level is low, you're insulin sensitive or insulin suppressed, you're primarily in fat adapted ketosis. These cells don't divide as quickly. Now, if you kill them, if you throw a toxin at them, which is chemotherapy, they don't recover as quickly. Yes, there's collateral damage. Your normal cells are also negatively affected by chemotherapy. But because there's a dual fuel source, these boys can regenerate. They can get back to basics. And these boys die in a higher propensity, a higher uh, likelihood of death. So you need lower doses of chemotherapy. The kill rate happens at a much lower dosing of chemotherapy, which is safer for your other tissues. And the kill rate and the regeneration rate is much lower the kill rate's higher and the regeneration rate is lower on the cancer. Particularly, and this has been studied in other countries, particularly Singapore, in breast cancer. And there's a group in Singapore, American physician working in Singapore, who specifically uses an ultra-low carbohydrate diet and in fact intermittent fasting or even prolonged fasting during cancer chemotherapy for breast cancer and has seen a dramatic improvement in stage reduction and kill rate at various stages. So lower death rate, lower complication rate in people who are fat adapted and fasting. Think that one through, folks. So for the treatment and the acceleration of disease, being on a ketogenic diet, becoming fat adapted, lowering your insulin rates has dramatic ancillary improvement in your cancer. And the final one, where again, I'm speculating here, I don't have data, there are cancer specialists uh, out there that are much better than me, Tom Siegfried, one of them in, in Boston, but others, who will tell you that even if you cannot kill or get rid of all the cancer, let's say you have stage three, stage four disease, it's elsewhere. Being on a ketogenic diet being fat adapted with low level um, of metabolic syndrome, low level of inflammation, low inflammatory levels, reduces the growth rate of metastases. So that your body, your immune system, is more likely to control and ward off and stabilize those metastases. If your immune system is distracted by inflammation all over your body, these guys grow in a ballistic way. It's not perfect, but it is a, re a reduction. Because look, we're all going to die. If we can do slow down the rate we're going to die of our metastatic cancer, we're going to live longer and have less side effects directly caused from the cancer. So there is never a reason, in my opinion, and I'm being a little bit absolutist there, but I can't think of a reason for someone with cancer or someone with a cancer risk history. My mother, or your, your, not me, but your mother had uterine cancer in early age. There's a breast hurt in you, or the Angelina Jolie genes. You're at risk. If you have a risk, if you actually have cancer, I cannot think of a reason not to be on a low insulin ketogenic diet and becoming fat adapted. I'll leave the details, the physiology of cancer, I can postulate. I'll leave that up to the experts. But this is such an important topic, even with my lack of knowledge. It is crucial, in my opinion, that I bring it to your attention so you can do something about it. And if you have a relative right now, if you're a woman, a younger woman, and your mother has breast cancer, there's a significant increased likelihood you're going to get it yourself. Do something prophylactically about it. Have the testing and everything else done, but do what you can do that nobody else can do for you to reduce your risk. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. I hope this has impacted on you.